Okay, this is uh, this is part two of my uh, of, of 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 the pseudocode uh, example that that I want to use to uh, to kind of illustrate all the different aspects of pseudocode uh, and the keywords that need to be used. Uh, part two here is going to focus on uh, this the second module here called Make PB Module that we didn't have uh, time for in in part one. So let's 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 just dive in here real quick. Um, for this make PB module, I want you guys to realize that that, that is being called here. Um, that is, you know, if the user's come in and is entered in yes for his PB choice, that he wants to learn how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, that's going to call this make PB module, okay? And this is a very specific pseudocode keyword that needs to be used, and it's, and it, and it's, called, it's called call. <laughs> right so so use call anytime you want to call another module and then once this module is done running uh, remember that that computers are uh, sequential um, if you wanted to you could put another statement under here um, you know blah 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 whatever whatever that statement is uh, and once this module is done running it's gonna run uh, this line here right so just remember that anytime you call modules uh, once this module is done running, it's just going to go to the next line. It's going to return right back to where it was and run the next line. Okay, so let's go down and look at this make uh, make PB module, um, and ignore all the the green funny stuff that Microsoft Word uh, likes to add to our pseudocode. Uh, it does the same thing if you try to copy and paste C plus plus code in here. Um, Word just doesn't know about the specific syntax of, of what we're we're typing in, right? Okay, so. For make PB module, um, I basically within this code down here, you'll you'll see in a second. There's two variables that I use uh, that don't need to be global variables because they're basically local variables uh, used within this code um, that that don't need to be that don't need to be used by any of the other modules. Okay, and that's why I actually declare them in this module is because they're only used by this make PB module, not and not any of the other modules. Okay, so if that's ever the case, if, if you if you need variables that are used within one particular module, you can declare them at the top of that module. If you have variables that are used, say, between three and four different modules, um, uh, for example, in your in your checkpoint one, uh, you have you have a few different variables that are used by a few different modules. You need to make sure those are declared in your main module as uh, global variables at the top of the main module. That's just what that's that's why the main module comes in handy is because any uh, any variables declared in the main module um, within within pseudocode uh, are global variables and they can be used um, with with all the different modules okay so I've, I've created some local variables here one called count one called temp um, that's just basically a temporary counter um, which which is a, a whole number and and a temp variable which is a which is a string and you're gonna see in a second uh, why we need these variables. Um, so we're basically going to say, not write, uh, you know, how many sandwiches uh, do you want? Uh, because the, the, the user of this program might want more than one sandwich, you know, he might be really hungry. Uh, so in case, uh, so once we do that, he can actually enter in uh, the number of sandwiches that he wants via this input statement, right? This input is a specific pseudocode command out outlined in your reading. Uh, and it's going to take whatever the user enters into the keyboard and store it into this num sandwiches uh, variable. Now, where does this num sandwiches variable come from? Uh, well, if you scroll up and look in the main module, uh, this is one of the global variables that all modules can use. So that's why it's not declared here. Okay. So we enter in the number of sandwiches that we want to make, and then we ask, "Do you want to add jelly on your sandwiches? Yes or no?" Uh, and the user can then basically enter in yes or no, and that that response is going to be stored in this variable called add jelly to sandwich, right? So now in memory, we we know the number of sandwiches uh, the user wants to create, and we know if the user wants to add jelly to sandwich just by storing those responses uh, in these variables. Okay. So now once we have these responses stored in the variables, now we're going to use what's called the iterative uh, loop control structure. And that's using this keyword uh, called for. And this keyword called for uh, is a very specific pseudocode command that is uh, also outlined in your reading. 
uh, and what it does is it needs to take a uh, an integer okay I don't think you can use you definitely can't use a string here um, you definitely need to use an integer I don't believe a float will work here um, just because I'm the I'm the pseudo compiler and I'm, I'm trying to think of all the the C++ the basic compilers the Java compilers I'm trying to think if you can use a, a float within within an iterative loop structure in those languages and I don't believe you can so make sure that if you use this for command make this an integer uh, and 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 what's important about this for command is you need to tell it what number to start with and then what number you want to end with. So we're going to go from 1 to whatever the number uh, is that the user entered in for the number of sandwiches uh, that they wanted to create here. So we're going to go 1 to, let's say the user entered in 3. We're going to go 1 to 3. Next is the step command, which is part of the for pseudocode command. The step command basically tells it, okay, so you're going 1 to 3. Let's say we're going one to four. Let's say it enters in the user enters in four sandwiches. You can actually tell it to step by two. You know, step by one is your normal step, right? So if you're stepping by one, you go one, two, three, four. If you're stepping by two, which you can, you can say step by two. Then all of a sudden you're going to go two, four, and be done, right? So you can you can change the interval at which uh, this four command goes through the sequence by using this step. But but more than likely, 99% of the time. Uh, for, for all of your assignments, you're just going to be stepping by one. Okay, so just use step one. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to use this for loop to loop through uh, the sequence of numbers, one to however many sandwiches uh, the user entered in. And notice that with this command, there's also an end tag for this command. Uh, it, it's a little confusing because, you know, it'd probably be more intuitive if it was like, uh, N4, uh, and since this is pseudocode, you you are more than welcome to write uh, N4. Um, but typically, like in the basic language, uh, you end the for loop via this command called next, and then you have to tell it which uh, which for loop you're ending. So you have to say next count, right? Because the for loop is using this this count variable, so you need to say next count, and that basically tells it that 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 this is the end of the for loop and everything inside in between this for and this next all this stuff here is is going to be uh, is going to be executed every loop okay so let's see what this loop uh, actually does right so we're starting at 1 let's say we're let's say let's do 1 to 3 sandwiches so we start at 1 so count is equal to 1 the first time it goes through this when counts equal to 1 the first thing it's going to do uh, well, it's going to display, uh, you know, put two pieces of bread on a plate, and then it's going to say, you know, hey, use a use a knife to to spread the peanut butter. Uh, I like these descriptions; they're very descriptive and don't leave any ambiguity to the user. He knows exactly what he needs to do. And now here's an interesting part. I like I like what uh, I like what Aaron did here. Is he used this add jelly to sandwich within a conditional statement here? And he says, if it's equal to yes, okay, then he adds an extra, well, it says print here, but you know what, we can say, we can say display. Let's, let's be very consistent. Then let's display, you know, he's going to tell the user, carefully go ahead and spread, uh, you know, your jelly over the peanut butter, which that's going to be a little messy. I would probably spread the jelly on the other piece of bread, but you know, that's, that's my preference. Anyways. Um, if add jelly to sandwich is equal to yes, this is a conditional logic statement, then we're going to spread the jelly over the peanut butter. We're going to display that. If it's equal to no or bananas or anything but yes, it's going to completely skip over the statement, which is great, right? That's exactly what we want. Uh, and then once if statement's done here, remember computers are, are, are sequential, right? So it's either going to display this or not depending on if this is true or false. If it's false, it's going to skip over it, and we're just going to execute these next two display statements. Uh, and then I like how he uses press enter to make the next sandwich. That's, that's, very, uh, that's very old school, <laughs> and uh, I, like, I like the way he does that. So uh, the user is told to press enter to make the next sandwich, and that works because we use this input, uh, this input keyword here, which, you know, this temp, the reason I call it temp is we don't care uh, what what the user enters in at this point. The only thing we care is that 
uh, he hits enter. Temp, he can enter whatever, whatever the heck he wanted here. Uh, but the key here is that this algorithm is waiting for the enter key and before it loops back around to the next for loop, right? So when it loops back around to the next for loop after the enter key, count is now going to be equal to the number two, right? Because this is the second loop and we're going one to the number of sandwiches, which we're sans three. So the second loop counts going to be equal to two. And so now when we get down here, um, we don't ever actually display the, the, the count number, which might be kind of cool. Um, but if we were to say, yeah, so, so basically we're at count number two and then it's going to execute all these lines again. And then it's going to say next count, go back up here. It's going to set count equal to three, right? And it's going to go through here a third time. Now on this final count equal to three, when it goes up to next count, it's going to realize, okay, that's the last number in the sequence. And it's, it's going to completely skip over all, all of these commands and finally hit the end module command, right? So uh, I want you guys to kind of realize that that's what's going on behind the scenes uh, when, when a computer is executing uh, these, these iterative loops, right? Is all these loops have a conditional, uh, have a condition in which they loop upon. And if this condition isn't met, it skips over everything that is within uh, that control structure. Same with this do while loop up here. If this while condition is not met, it's not going to run this stuff. Okay. Uh, so, so that's the, uh, the short version here. Uh, I need you guys to go back and really read up on all of these pseudocode keywords like module, like declare, uh, like do, uh, like, well, your book may use write, but I, I'm, I'm going to say display, uh, words like input, uh, keyword if, okay. And there's another keyword called called else that's very handy here uh, and then make sure that you always use these uh, these end tags to to denote the end of your if statement and the end of your your modules and also anytime you use strings make sure to use these quotation marks okay these are all this is all very specific because compilers are very specific and um, you guys need to get used to this because if you try to just kind of haphazardly throw throw together uh, a program uh, on on a real compiler, you're not going to go anywhere. So I want you guys to get used to uh, using these very specific pseudocode commands. And I'm going to kind of act as the compiler and give you guys feedback and let you know uh, you've got a couple bugs in there. Uh, see if you can find them, okay? Or if you can't find them, I'm going to I'm going to help point point out where they are. Okay, so that's basically the end of part two. Uh, I hope that helped everybody. Um, that was just a lot easier to to kind of say all this and get get this all out without typing it it, it all up. Uh, and I also wanted to kind of put in a little advertisement for my tutorial videos for checkpoint one, uh, week three. Uh, I made several uh, several videos uh, for what's required in checkpoint one of week three, uh, and that that requires flow charts, that requires the IPO chart, uh, and that requires a, a test table. Uh, and I kind of went went through uh, all those things that are required for for checkpoint one of week three, uh, and kind of showed you guys how how to implement those with an example that's similar to your assignment. So uh, please go go back and, and and check out that thread. Check out those tutorials. I think those tutorials are going to help you out uh, help you out with this the checkpoint that's due this weekend. Uh, and let me know if uh, these tutorials helped here. Okay. Uh, so I look forward to hearing from everyone and let's um, and let's have a great week. Thanks.